Welcome to Rad Quarters. This is Ultrasound of Carpal Tunnel Syndrome. I'm Dr. Dan Koval, and this episode is sponsored by Samsung Ultrasound. The beautiful images you're about to see were obtained on a Samsung RS85 Prestige Ultrasound Unit. I'm going to review case examples of Carpal Tunnel Syndrome and explain wrist anatomy. So let's start by looking at the CT appearance of the carpal tunnel. So here we're at the proximal carpal tunnel. This is an axial view of the wrist with bone windows. And this is the ventral side. Here's the radial side where the thumb would be located. And this bone here is the scaphoid bone. On the other side, this is the ulnar aspect. This bone is the pisiform bone. So you can see that we have these twin peaks of bony outcropping. When we move a bit more distally in the carpal tunnel, again, this is the ventral aspect. On the radial side, we have the trapezium bone, and this small outcropping is the trapezium tubercle. On the ulnar aspect, we have the hamate bone, and this curvilinear part of the bone is known as the hook of the hamate. And this anatomy correlates well to the ultrasound appearance. So if we look at the ultrasound here, again, we're at the proximal carpal tunnel here. This bone is the scaphoid bone, and this is the pisiform bone. And you can see this is the normal curvilinear appearance of the bony cortex. So the rest of the bone is shadowed out. This curvilinear structure here is the flexor retinaculum, and just behind that is the median nerve. Deep to that, we have the flexor tendons. So these are the flexor digitorum superficialis tendons and the flexor digitorum profundus tendons more deeply. They have that normal echogenic compact fibrillar structure that we expect to see with tendons. Another tendon here is the flexor carpi radialis tendon that will lie directly over the scaphoid bone, so you can use the scaphoid as a landmark for that tendon. So again, if we move distally, instead of the scaphoid and pisiform bones, we now have the trapezium and the handmade bones. And again, there's that flexor retinaculum, just deep to that, the median nerve, and we have the flexor tendons here. And you can see they're a bit more hypoechoic on this image compared to this one. That's due to the artifact known as anisotropy. So when the ultrasound beam hits the compact fibular structure of tendons at an angle less than 90 degrees, it becomes a bit more hypoechoic instead of that normal echogenicity but that can easily be corrected by toggling the transducer back and forth. Now, if we move more proximal to these regions, here we're at the upper wrist at the distal aspect of the forearm, and we can see the muscles that correspond to those flexor digitorum tendons. So this is the flexor digitorum superficialis muscle group, and deep to that is the flexor digitorum profundus muscle group. Deeper still is the pronator quadratus, and that's a band-like muscle that extends between the radius and ulna. And the median nerve, like all nerves, will have a typical honeycomb appearance, more of a fascicular pattern with surrounding echogenic connective tissue, as opposed to that echogenic fibrillar structure we see with tendons. Now, carpal tunnel syndrome is the most common upper extremity entrapment neuropathy. And what we'll see as the median nerve approaches the carpal tunnel, it will become hypochoic and enlarged, and then flattened at the level of the tunnel, yielding the notch sign. So here we have a sagittal view. This is proximal and this is distal. These are the carpal bones down here, and these are the flexor tendons that we were just looking at on transverse. Here is the thickened hypoechoic median nerve, and notice how it becomes a flattened diameter here. That's the notch sign. So that's typical for carpal tunnel syndrome. You might also see volar bowing of the flexor retinaculum on transverse images. So the median nerve area can also be evaluated. Normally it will be less than eight millimeters squared. If it's in the eight to 12 millimeter squared size, that's kind of borderline. Greater than 12 millimeters is typically abnormal. But a more accurate assessment for carpal tunnel syndrome is to compare the difference of the median nerve area as you move proximal to distal, more specifically at the level of the pronator quadratus muscle and at the carpal tunnel. And studies have shown if there's an increase in just two millimeters squared or more as you move from proximal to distal, that's 100% specific for carpal tunnel syndrome. That diameter measurement should also be made inside that echogenic epineurium, which is the surrounding echogenic connective tissue. So here, in this case, if we look at the proximal aspect of the wrist, this is the pronator quadratus here, as we saw in that previous example. And if we measure at the proximal third of this muscle, you can see the median nerve area is seven millimeters squared. So that's in the range of normal. And then when we measure the maximal dimension in the carpal tunnel here more distally, the area is 10 millimeters squared. So that would fall in the borderline range if we were just looking at the area alone. But when we compare the caliber change, that's an increase in caliber of three millimeters squared as we moved proximal to distal. And that's consistent with carpal tunnel syndrome. And indeed, that's what the patient presented with clinically. Now, there are a few anatomic variants to be aware of when evaluating for carpal tunnel syndrome on ultrasound. So here we are back at the level of the carpal tunnel. Here's the flexor retinaculum, and there's the median nerve, but then here's also the median nerve. So we actually see two median nerves in this case. In between them, there's this small little anechoic structure. When we add color Doppler flow, there's flow within it indicating that it's a vessel. 
So this was an example of a patient with a bifid median nerve, so two branches of the median nerve, and also a, another variant, a persistent median artery. So this bifid median nerve is also known as a high division of the median nerve. It's a normal variant that we see in about 15% of the population. And one of these trunks might actually take an aberrant course through the flexor digitorum superficialis muscle before it gets to the carpal tunnel. And this bifid nerve is often associated with a persistent median artery passing between the two trunks. And that's important to recognize preoperatively because this persistent median artery could be damaged during surgery. Here's the flexor retinaculum. If the patient has carpal tunnel release, you can see how this vessel is just below that retinaculum. This can also occur in the setting of a solitary median nerve. And in that case, the persistent median artery is usually located at the ulnar aspect of the nerve. And to diagnose carpal tunnel in these patients that have a bifid median nerve, you have to measure the diameter of both of these and then combine them. And instead of a two millimeter increase, you want a four millimeter squared increase or more as you move from the pronator quadratus to the carpal tunnel to make the diagnosis. All right, let's look at another case. So here's a patient. We're looking at the transverse wrist. This is the scaphoid bone as a landmark proximal carpal tunnel. And then you can see here the median nerve looks hypoechoic and flattened. And when we measure the area, it's 15 millimeters squared. Remember, that's more than 12 millimeters squared. So that's abnormally enlarged. At that similar level, scaphoid pisiform, proximal carpal tunnel, transverse wrist, there's the median nerve. Notice that the flexor retinaculum is bowed, volarly. So that's another finding we can see in carpal tunnel syndrome. When we turn sagittally, you can see that the thickened nerve becomes flattened as it moves towards the carpal tunnel, and we have flattening with the notch sign. So these features all suggest carpal tunnel syndrome. However, notice that there's this ill-defined hypoechoic area just deep to the skin surface there in the subcutaneous fat. That represents some scar tissue because this patient actually had carpal tunnel release three years prior and was now asymptomatic, had complete resolution of their carpal tunnel syndrome. So this is a normal postoperative appearance in a patient with carpal tunnel release. So the median nerve may return to normal diameter after surgery, or it could stay like this case where it can remain enlarged regardless of the clinical outcome. So in these cases, you really have to correlate the images with the patient's symptoms. Another finding we might see with carpal tunnel release is that the retinaculum might be a little thickened or disrupted. And if we look back at the flexor retinaculum here, you can see it's kind of ill-defined and irregular due to the carpal tunnel release. That's a normal postoperative appearance. You might also see volar displacement of the nerve after the surgery. That's also considered normal. All right, let's look at one more case. So here's a patient presenting with a mass and right hand numbness and tiggling, also decreased sensation over the median nerve distribution. So here we're looking at a sagittal view of the wrist, and you can see that there's this ovoid echogenic mass measuring about 3.9 centimeters. When we turn transverse, you can see the mass here, and this is most consistent with a lipoma. But notice something else here. So here's the median nerve, just anterior to the lipoma, and just posterior to that, we have those flexor digitorum tendons. And the median nerve looks a bit hypoechoic and thickened here. When we turn sagittally, again, the median nerve is hypoechoic and thickened in the region of this lipoma as it approaches the carpal tunnel. And then deep to that is the flexor digitorum tendons, which we can see nicely here on the sagittal view. And at surgery, this was a large lipoma originating at the flexor tendons in the proximal carpal tunnel. So it was exacerbating the carpal tunnel syndrome. Now here we're looking at a cine clip, transverse ventral wrist in this patient. Here's the flexor digitorum musculature. This is the median nerve right here. And as we move distally towards the carpal tunnel, notice how this nerve starts to get thickened here. We can identify it as a nerve because it has that honeycomb fascicular appearance with the surrounding echogenic connective tissue, the epineurium and perineurium. And then there's that lipoma here exerting some mass effect, which we can note as we extend into the carpal tunnel, the nerve continues to get hypoechoic, remains enlarged, and there's the flexor retinaculum. So important to identify masses such as this because a simple carpal tunnel release might not fully relieve the symptoms since there's also mass effect from this tumor and that would be useful for the surgeon to know about. Also note that other causes of extrinsic compression against the median nerve include ganglion cyst and tenosynovitis. All right, thank you so much for joining me and I hope you found this educational. Thank you again to our sponsor, Samsung Ultrasound. If you like this lecture, a great free way to support us is to subscribe to the video podcast on Spotify or Apple or by clicking the subscribe button on YouTube. I also post interesting teaching files throughout the week that you can find by following us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and Reddit or by clicking the YouTube community tab. Until next time, radiology is life. 